these uh, little threat that they're going to take out the middle pews if you don't move up. Uh, reminds me of a story that used to be told to uh, all my preaching classes that we had while I was at Talbot Seminary. One of those was simply this, that uh, a young man went into a church and he saw it for the first time and he says it was really strange. He saw the pulpit way up front, but there was no pews in front of the pulpit. There was only one row and the row was absolutely in the back. And there were some ushers there. And when that pew was absolutely full with people, then the usher would step on the thing and it would all of a sudden slide all the way to the front and another pew would pop up in the back. And the preacher was going, wow, look at that. Everybody's automatically in front. Well, he thought that was a great thing and he really got charged up and he decided he was going to preach a really great sermon. So he got really involved in his message. However, he noticed something, that at five minutes of 12, all of a sudden everybody was looking at their watch. And at 12 o'clock, a trap door opened up underneath him. <laughs> great for the preacher, great for the audience too. So it was just uh, that way. It was an ideal church from every standpoint in that particular way. Uh, glad that you're here this morning. Glad that you came to worship and that you're ready to center upon what the Lord is going to do. Got a lot of things that we need to pray about and a lot of things that we need to keep with. You know, rain is nice, but it has been a problem for the gutters that are outside and trying to keep them clean and trying to make sure that uh, we don't wind up with some problems in the church. So uh, pray that the, if we do get some good rain, we need it, that it doesn't overflow it under those circumstances at this particular moment. Also, we've got people that are still going through health crises in their own way. Uh, Keith Ward's uh, wife is still in the hospital at this particular point. She's in the re rehabilitation hospital. Her physical therapists are saying, she's doing good. She's ready to go home. However, the doctor hasn't given that clearance at this moment. Pray that she will soon get home and that uh, Keith will be back with his mate in just a real quick time. Uh, heard this morning that Marion had a little difficulty over the weekend. He had a, a situation in which he was really feeling poorly and almost passed out. Uh, he is uh, due to see his uh, cardiologist very soon. They are thinking that it's a possible problem with his heart. Please be in prayer concerning that. We know, too, that uh, Lottie has gone, been going through quite a little bit of things with what's taking place in her life. Uh, her circulation isn't real good in her feet, and the doctor is saying that she needs a heart surgery in order to improve the circulation in the feet, and I don't know if a decision has been made on that yet. She hasn't made a decision fully on it uh, uh, at this moment. Jessica's also due to see her doctor this week, and they're going to find out whether she's actually passed that kidney stone or not. They're going to try to find out about it. You know, there's lots of things that are going that way. Along with that, there's just a myriad of other requests. If you don't get the Wednesday night prayer sheet, we'd love to send it to you. We'd love you to be involved with our Wednesday night Bible study to where you can uh, pray with us, that you can understand the requests that are taking place and that you can be involved. Uh, we're hoping eventually that we'll get back to just having a Bible study back there in the back. Um, I'll give you a little hint that in a little bit I'm planning to go through the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation is a tough book to go through. Every time I've gone through it, it takes me a year and a half. That's because we go through it thoroughly. We don't skip things. We want to go through the entire book and have an understanding of it because there's a special blessing to he who understands that particular book, Scripture says. So we'll be uh, going to that in the near future, not just uh, immediately. We'll be doing that soon. Next week, remember, is Father's Day, and on Father's Day, we are going to take a look at uh, a different passage concerning Father's Day. David gave an instruction to his son Solomon just before he passed away, and we're going to take a look at that instruction because it tells us from a godly man what he wanted his son to understand and how he ought to be a godly person as well in order to follow the Lord, and we'll be talking about that next week in our morning worship service. Uh, we want you to also be here and to encourage others to come and to, to be involved with us. You know, understanding the Word of God is really important. We're living in a society that is Bible ignorant. You can sometimes ask them just to name the books of the Bible and they can't do it. Along with the fact that they can't do it, they don't know what the content of it is. They will tell you that they believe that the Bible is important, but most of them have dust on it from, their, uh, from the time that it sits on their, their counter. 
they haven't really read it under those circumstances. So uh, join us on Wednesday night. We've been going through the minor prophets. So I'm not going to be in the minor prophets this week. We're going to change that. Um, haven't quite decided which book we're going to look at. It will be a short uh, study in its own regards. But join us for that on this Wednesday night. If you haven't got a Zoom attachment, call uh, the office. They'll be more than sure to make sure that you get that attachment and that you get the uh, Zoom call so that you can be a part with us. Be in print prayer too for Kent. They're um, having a little bit of a problem with medical things in the government. Trying to figure out how they're going to handle things. And it is a very stressful time for him, especially with him being a uh, uh, not able to be with other people in a room, and he's got now a roommate, and that is posing a bit of a problem. So be in prayer for him as he goes through the stress and strain of his time right now. Let's just look to the Lord before we do begin our morning message. Let's pray. Right now, Lord, I want to quiet my heart before you and the heart of everyone that is here and just come into your presence. Father, you are a mighty God, a Lord above all gods, who is capable of doing everything that he has ever said and everything that he has ever promised. And Father is incomparable. You are holy, you are just, you are righteous. You show mercy, you show loving kindness. You, Father, are concerned for the needs of your, your children, and you, God, Minister to those as only you can. You are not a God that is above us to where you do not ever think of us. But God, you are intimately involved in lives all over this world. And for that we are thankful. You so love this world that you sent your son Jesus to die upon the cross for our sins. That he, Father, might reconcile us to you. And that we might be your dear children. And be justified before you and be able to be in your midst forevermore. We don't deserve it. But God, he so loved us that he did that. And we are thankful for it. And we pray, Father, that as we examine his life through the book of Luke, that you, God, might give us understanding. That you might give us real wisdom. That you might help us to, to catch a, a glimpse of who Jesus is. And of what he does. And Father of how we ought to respond to him. We come to you today to pray for those who are in times of need. We pray for Kent that Father as he has now a roommate. And they're trying to settle what his condition can be in the home. God give wisdom. Lord help the government to understand fully <clears throat> his situation. And God not only to understand his situation but God, to respond to it in a favorable way. We pray for Marion. Lord, we are concerned with Father, the fact that he basically passed out the other day, and ask God that you might give the wisdom to the doctors as to how to treat him at this moment. The concern is that it's his heart, Father, but you know even more than they do. For God, you understand everything that takes place for us. And we ask God that you would give him strength at this moment and that you would help him. We pray for Jessica as she's gone through so many things, Father, with this, these kidney stones. And we ask God that they would pass and that they would no longer be there. We pray for Keith Ward's wife and ask God that she would be able to come home soon and that she could be with him again. And that, Father, the progress that she has made will be sufficient for the doctors to see that. We pray for Lottie, God, and ask God that as she comes to a stage where she has to make a decision concerning whether or not she will have a, a heart surgery or not, that you would give her real wisdom. Lord, at her age, it's hard to decide to put yourself under the knife. But God, we ask that you would give her real wisdom at this moment as to what she should do. And Lord, there are so many others who are going through things like a, a, a soon-to-be cataract surgery as as. Uh, our brother is going to have. We ask God that you would help each one to be dependent upon you. And God, we are so thankful to you that you are one who knows our every need 
and knows it even better than we can speak it. And we pray that you would give us wisdom at this time. Thank you now. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Take your Bibles, if you would, this morning and turn to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. We've been going through the Gospel of Luke, which talks about the Son of Man and the Savior of mankind. And this week we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 35. Luke chapter 7, verses 18 through 35. And I have entitled this particular message, Jesus Responds to a Question. Jesus Responds to a Question. Shall we stand together as we read the word of the Lord? Luke 7, verses 18 through 35. The disciples of John reported to him about all these things. Summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? When the men came to him, they said to him, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask you, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? At that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. And he answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walked, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. When the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are in splendid clothing and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I say to you, one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare the way before you. I say to you, amongst those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. When all of the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice. Having been baptized, with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, having not been baptized by John. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Got a question. You ever been a doubter? You ever been somebody who just really isn't convinced that things are going to go the right way or things aren't going to be proper or fitting? Have you ever been somebody who uh, takes a look at a situation and say, ah, that's not going to work? No way, no how. You're not seeing something that is going to happen. Or have you ever been convinced that uh, others can do it, not me. That's not what I can do. You know, I can watch some of these people who do some very great things with Bear Grill and others on TV, and I would say, no way am I trying that, and no, I don't want to eat rattlesnake. But, you know, basically what it amounts to is there are lots of people who have uh, doubts, lots of people who are not quite sure what's happening. We've got people in the United States that aren't sure that the economy is going to be okay at this moment. They have a doubt concerning it because of all of the things that are taking place. We have other people who are doubting that there can be any government that is doing things right. And so they question it at all times. They are doubters. They're not convinced about their situation or about what is taking place. And you see sometimes doubt in Scripture. In Scripture, there are several great men, great spiritual men, that had periods of confusion and doubt. 
Now, we're going to see that right now. So get your Bibles ready, and you're going to turn to it as we go to it. The first one is going to be found in the book of Numbers. Moses was ready to quit, according to Numbers, chapter 11, verses 11, 10 through 15. Basically, what it amounts to is that the children of Israel were complaining, and they were really upset that they were only getting, getting manna. All we have every morning is manna, manna, manna. Manna, manna, manna. I'm tired of manna, no matter what. Yes, God's giving it to us, and we don't have to go out and work for it, but enough is enough. They're complaining. What takes place? Look at verse 10. Now Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, each one at the entrance of his tent, and angry of the Lord because of the very, of the very hot. And Moses was displeased. And Moses said to the Lord, Why have you been so hard on your servant? And why have you not found favor in your sight? That you have put burdens on this people, on me? Was it, was it I who conceived all this people? Or did I give birth to them? That you should say, Carry them in your arms as a nurse carries an infant to the land which you swore by their fathers. Where am I to get meat to give to the people? For they weep before me, saying, Give us meat so that we may eat. I am not able to carry all this my, to the people myself because it is too burdensome for me. So if you are going to deal with me this way, please kill me now. I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see this misery." Moses was really uh, upset, wasn't he? God, the circumstances I'm facing are so terrible. I can't do anything about that. I can't change your manna into meat. They want meat to eat. Why are you putting that burden on me? You know, we sometimes tell God that what you're allowing me to go through is too much. And Moses was not unlike us in many respects. I want you to take a look at a second person that we have here, Elijah. Turn to 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 19. Now you'll remember that Elijah stood against the prophets of Baal. Man, here was a man who was spiritually strong. Here was a man who went against 400 of the prophets of Baal, 800 of the prophets of Baal, and did not waver one bit. He did what he wanted to do. He told them, you take the morning service, I'll take the evening service, and whosoever God brings down fire from heaven to consume the altar that they build, we will worship him. And when they started their service in the morning, he mocked them. He told them, you better shout louder because your God isn't hearing you. You better cut yourself more because he's not seen it. You better do more things. And then after they saw absolutely nothing happen, the time of the evening offering was about to come, and he built an altar. When he built an altar, he put the sacrifice upon it, and after the sacrifice was put upon it, he dug a trench around it, and then told them to douse the offerings in water. Not once, not twice, not three times, but four times, so that the trench was absolutely full. Then he called out to God to bring down fire upon his altar. And God did. And all the water was licked up. Every single drop of it to where there was nothing left. And then they made Baal burgers out of the prophets of Baal. They killed them. The simple fact is, is that he then ran, he then found that Jezebel was saying that she was going to make a Elijah burger out of him. She was going to kill him because he had done so much to the prophets of Baal. And chapter 19 shows that this man who stood against all those prophets was scared of one woman. So scared that he ran from her presence. So scared that he actually got to a stage where he wanted to die. Notice verse 9. 
Then they came to a cave and spent a night there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been zealous for the Lord, the God of the armies, the sons of Israel, have abandoned your covenant and torn down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they have sought my life. He's saying, God, my life is in danger. I don't want to live. In fact, he goes on to say later on in this chapter, I alone stand for Jehovah. And God says, wait a minute. There are 7,000 who haven't bowed the knee before Baal. You aren't alone. I know. And yet, because he was so depressed, because he was so doubting of, the God, of God taking care of him, he asked to die, and the Lord was going to allow that when Elisha was anointed as his heir. Notice the third one, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, turn to Jeremiah chapter 20. In verses 7 through 9, there we read, Lord, you persuaded me, and I let myself be persuaded. You have overcome me and prevailed. I have become the laughing stock all day long. Everyone mocks me. For each time I speak, I cry aloud. I proclaim violence and destruction because for me, the word of the Lord has resulted in taunting and derision all day long. But if I say, I will not remember him nor speak any more in his name, then my heart becomes like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I am tired of beholding it. I cannot endure it. That's kind of amazing, isn't it? Then Elijah is saying, Lord, I go and proclaim your message before the people and they say that I am wrong, that I'm just a laughing stock. Lord, it's not right what is happening to me. Go to verse 14 and look at verses 14 through 18 where he says there, Cursed be the day when I was born. May the day when my mother gave birth to me not be blessed. Cursed be the man who who brought the news to my father saying, a boy has been born to you and made him very happy. But may that man be like the cities which the Lord overthrew without relenting. And may he hear an outcry in the morning and an alarm for the war at noon because he did not kill me before birth so that my mother would have been in my grave my and her womb forever pregnant. Why did I ever come out of the womb to look at the trouble and sorrow so that my days have been shame? Wow. Here's a servant of God that's saying, I dread the day I was born. God, you're not doing what I want you to do. And because of that, I doubt that you're, you're really taking care of it. I'm in a situation that is really bad. You ever felt that way? That uh, God isn't giving you consideration? Now, we say, okay, those are all Old Testament. What about the New Testament, Pastor? Okay, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And look at what the Apostle Paul said. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that our afflictions which occurred for us in Asia, that they were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even of life, Indeed, we had the sentence of death within ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves but in God who raises the dead. We are in despair. You ever felt that way? God, what can I do? How can I get by? What can happen? Well, this passage deals with that because it's dealing with the situation with John the Baptist. John the Baptist, remember, was the forerunner of the king. He's already been seen in this book. 
He's been seen in that he proclaimed that Jesus was the Messiah, and he even baptized Jesus. John had been in jail at this particular point for a number of months. Because he went against Herodias, and because he went against the wrong marriage that was done in that family, he was thrown into prison, and Herod had put him there and kept him there. He really wanted to hear from the prophet on many occasions, but he was in a prison situation, and let me clue you, jails were not good in those days. They were the worst place that you could possibly be. He had received reports at the same time from the disciples, his disciples, as to the ministry of Jesus. You see, they saw him doing miracles. They saw him healing people. They came back and reported everything that was happening. Third, no Jewish leader ever interceded for John the Baptist. None. They didn't go to his defense. They basically allowed him to be in prison. They didn't talk about him whatsoever. And not only that, but he knew that the Messiah was not only going to do a lot of miracles, he came to set the captives free. And as John looked at it, he was a captive. If I'm a captive, why am I not being set free if this is really Messiah? He's got really a question in his mind. Wait a minute. Jesus is doing all the miracles of Messiah, but he's not doing the deliverance of Messiah. So I've got a problem. It's not that he has a disbelief. It is at this particular moment that he is a doubter, and therefore he sends his disciples to Jesus. So today's message is basically going to be this. What does the question of John the Baptist indicate about his faith? Second, what does that mean for us today? And third, what is the difference between unbelief and doubt? Because we need to know those things. Because, face it, if you haven't had some situation in where you had a little doubt, you're wrong. Um... Uh, a number of years ago, I sat in the chair of the office of the Trinity Bible Church of Southgate. Now, that building is a building that seats 540 people. It had been full at one point, and I took a look at the sanctuary, and I took a look at what was taking place on that corner, and I sat in the office for the very first time, and I looked up and prayed to the Lord and said, God, are you sure? Is this where I belong? Is this where I need to be at this particular moment? Is this what I need to do? You see, God works in mysterious ways, and sometimes we don't feel adequate. Sometimes we question whether God is adequate. Sometimes we even question whether we're in the middle of His will. What do we do about that? We have to really talk about it. So what is the difference between doubt and unbelief? First, Doubt is a matter of the mind, thinking. We can't understand what God is doing. God, as I look at the circumstance, this isn't the way that I would do it, and I don't understand how this is going to work out for your honor and glory. God, I don't see how this works. Second, we can't understand why God is doing are not doing an action. Why aren't you stopping it? When you take a look at the book of Habakkuk in the Old Testament, he basically asks in the first chapter, God, how can you let Israel get away with their ungodliness? God says, I'm not. I'm going to judge them by the evil nations round about them. And he looks and says, but God, they're worse than Israel is. How can you use them to do it? How can they get away with it? God says, they're not. I'm going to judge them too. And Habakkuk finally comes to the purpose of knowing that God is in control. Because sometimes we just have to ask, what are you doing, God? Look at the Psalms. David asks it over and over and over again. God, how can? How can? How can? That's an indication of his doubt from his mind. 
Now, unbelief is a matter of the will. You see, we have intellect that thinks. Then we have a will that acts. And the will that acts, acts upon what it has determined that is right or wrong. So basically what we say is that the person who has unbelief refuses to believe the Word of God. I had a young man at uh, Disneyland when I was there a long time ago by the name of Dan Driscoll. Dan came to me when he found out I went to seminary and says, do you believe the virgin birth? I said, Dan, if it isn't that way, Jesus Christ cannot be my Savior. So, yes, I believe in the virgin birth. He goes, I can't believe in that. I won't believe in that. There's just no way. He had made up his mind already, and anything that went against what his mind said, he wasn't going to believe no matter what. You refuse to believe God's word, and then you refuse to believe what he says. If God says, this is right, that is wrong, we don't take it that way. We make up our own mind as to what is right or wrong. Do you realize that our society is doing that a lot today? A whole lot. We say to ourselves, we want to act this way, therefore God's got to be wrong that he judges that. Scripture says homosexuality, incorrect. Man says, but that's who I am. That's who I am. And so they make their will above God's will. So what do we have here? We have a statement from Oswald Chambers. He gives a real instance about, uh, about doubt. He says this, doubt is, doubt is not always a sign that man is wrong. It may be a sign that he's thinking. Now, that doesn't mean that he's thinking correctly. But it does mean that he's thinking. And when he's thinking and he's going through it and wavering over everything, the question is, what does his result come to? Does he come to a point where he says, God, I don't understand this. I can't understand it under any circumstances. But Lord, I trust you. I trust your word. That's what we have to do. So let's take a look at this situation that we find in Luke chapter 7. Turn back there, if you will. Luke chapter 7. Verses 18 through 35. And take a look at the first part of verse 18. The disciples of John also reported to him in all these things. After summoning two of his disciples, John sent them to the Lord, saying, are you, com are, you the coming, are you the coming one, or do we look for another? John the Baptist's doubt was not one of willful unbelief. But it was a doubt nourished by physical and emotional strain. It was done by the emotional strain and the physical strain of him being in prison for so long and him looking at the situation and not being able to be free, not able to see it on his own, and he's just going, I don't understand what's happening. Lord, why? You ever have an illness and ask yourself, why did God allow me to go through this? My daughter, Wendy, at times asks that question. She asks that question of, why me? And that's not uncommon that we ask that particular question. And we can point back the result of what has happened to the fact that man is a sinner and he has fallen short of the glory of God. At the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, when they made the decision not to follow his commandments, in motion was set everything that is needed for us to die today. And because of that, the bodies fail. Because of that, our mind fails. Because of that, situations happen. And it is appointed onto every single one of us wants to die. And we don't like that. We don't like suffering. We don't like going through hard situations. But his question wasn't, is Jesus doing wrong things? His question is, why wasn't Jesus doing all that Messiah promised? He was preaching. He was healing. He was raising the dead. 
He was taking care of lepers. He was doing everything that was necessary to do. Why wasn't he doing the second part of it? Freeing the captives. Because as John looked around, that was him. So his disciples asked the question for John. Jesus gives a confirmation when that question was asked. You'll notice that the question is in verse 20. Look at verse 21. At that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who, believe, who were blind. And he answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you have seen. People who were blind receive sight. People who were limped walk. People who have leprosy are cleansed. And people who were deaf hear. And the people and dead people are raised up. And the people who are poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is everyone who does not take offense at me. Notice first, when these guys come to Jesus, they said, he doesn't say, gentlemen, sit down. You've got to understand a little theology. I'm going to give you a lesson on questioning God. I'm going to talk to you about how you are wrong in your attitudes and everything else. There's no theological lecture here. Jesus doesn't do that at all. Why? Because Jesus was busy ministering to people. And as he was busy ministering to people, he simply did this. He told the disciples of John to report back to John what they were seeing. They were watching Jesus as he healed people. The blind, the lame, people with leprosy, people who are deaf, people who were dead are healed or raised up. They are Changed in a moment, in an instant. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What he's saying is, I'm doing the work of God. And I'm doing it in the time that God has given me to do. Just go back and report that to John. Tell him what you're seeing. Tell him what you're seeing. I want you to notice that there is an interesting word at the end of verse 23. Verse 23 says there, Blessed is everyone who does not take offense at me. That word offense comes from the Greek word skandalizo. It's the word that we get scandalized from. John was in danger of being trapped by his thoughts of what Jesus was doing. To get put into a wrong situation. And you know, you can think yourself into trouble. You can think yourself into a lot of trouble. Jesus told him to center on what he was doing, the signs of Messiah. He was doing everything that Isaiah 61, 1 and 2 said he was to do, except remember, he stopped when he talked about freeing the captives. Because the rest of what is going to be done isn't going to be done in his first ministry. It is going to be done in his second ministry. The second coming of Jesus. He came the first time as the suffering servant. He comes the second time as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is going to rule. He is going to set all things right. He is going to free those who are captive. He is going to do it 100%. It's according to God's time. When he's supposed to do it. So notice. That displays what the world's view is of the church today. You know what the world sees in the church? It sees something that uh, they think isn't good. The church is not changing the world, so it's not good. We haven't taken care of all the social injustice, all the economic problems. We haven't taken care of all the poor that are out there. We haven't taken care of all of the family situations that are there. Politic political things remain wrong. And so because the church isn't doing that, we doubt that the church is really God's instrument. When you know what Scripture teaches? The answer is that God changes the heart of man 
when he comes into a relationship with him. He forgives his sin. And at that moment, the man changes from seeking his own way to actually beginning to desire what God's way is. And when he desires what God's way is, then he changes and has a different view of things. He loves his neighbor as himself. He cares for man. He wants to change what's happening in society. He sees the injustice and knows that it's the sinfulness of man that is bringing about those situations. And so he wants to change. You see, the world is looking at the wrong thing. What's wrong with why the church can't solve problems? Because there's not enough saved people in the church. There's not enough people who have had their sins forgiven. There's not enough people that have been changed, been made new in Jesus Christ because they have come to know Him. Notice that John's commendation by Jesus then comes. Verse 24. When the messengers of John left, they, he began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out to see in the wilderness? A reed shaken by the wind? What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you. And one that is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare the way of the Lord. I say to you amongst those born of women, there is no one greater than John. What did the people see when they went out to see John minister? Remember, he did it by the Jordan River. He baptized many there. Was it someone unsure of himself? A reed blowing in the wind? No. John was sure of himself. Even when the Pharisees and scribes came, he pronounced judgment against them. When he saw people who need to be repentant, he called them to repentance. He was preaching Jesus Christ specifically and telling them about the judgment that was to come. Was he dressed in fine clothing? Well, if you consider camel's hair, really fine clothing, uh, you can have mine. I don't want that. Man, it's ugly against the skin. It is not good. That's how he was dressed. He was confident in his message. He was dressed in harsh clothing. He was a godly man calling people to repentance. He was doing that all the time. And scripture says something else about him. Did they go out to see a prophet? John was a prophet. He's the last Old Testament prophet in scripture. He also was the forerunner of Messiah. He's the one who was proclaiming he was to come. He made known the fact that he wasn't Messiah, but Messiah was soon to come. And Jesus says, no man greater than John has ever been born. No one. No man. The only one that's greater than he is the God-man, Jesus Christ. Then he says something different. I want you to notice following that. He says, I say to you, amongst those born of women, there is no one greater than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. The least in the kingdom of God is greater than John. What does that mean? The people in the kingdom of God are those who have been saved, who have been justified, who have been cleansed of their sin, who are the children of God. Therefore, he's saying at this point, those people are greater than John. And note that it says at that time that many were baptized. Baptized with John's repentance. Um, Jesus likened the Pharisees and the scribes to childlike people. They wanted what satisfied them. You ever uh, notice that kids are really particular about what they want? You can offer a kid sometimes corn chips when he wants Cheetos. And he will not eat the corn chips because he wants Cheetos. He doesn't want a red popsicle. He wants an orange one. And if it isn't an orange one, he doesn't want it at all. 
So because of that, the Pharisees are much like that. I want you to notice what he says there in verse 31. To what then shall we compare the people of this generation and what are they like? They are like children who sit in the marketplace and call to one another saying, we played the flute for you and you did not dance. We sang a song of mourning and you did not weep. In other words, we did what we wanted to and we expected a result. The Jews expected a result. Jewish religious leaders. When they didn't get the result they wanted, they were done with it. They wanted God to do things their way at their time. Because of that, they say, John has a demon. After all, who goes out in the wilderness and preaches and eats locust and wild honey and tells people to be baptized? Somebody who's consumed by a demon. Not us. We're in the city. We're sharing the word of God. What do they say about Jesus? They say Jesus is a gluttonous man. He's eating all the time. He's a drunkard. He's drunken wine, even with sinners. He has made himself the wrong type of person. He's bad because he's doing things wrong. Not like we would do. We are righteous. So what's the application for us? Um, first, Realize that only God has everything under control. I don't have to worry whether or not things are going to happen the way God planned. They will. I don't know all about God's plan. I don't know every nuance of it. I don't know what he has planned in every set of circumstances. But I do know this, that he knows the beginning and the end, and he has everything filled in. It's just as he planned it. We have to admit our lack of understanding sometimes and just say, God, I don't understand what you're attempting to do, but I'm going to trust you and I'm going to wait and see how you work this out. I shared with you on a number of occasions that when we headed up to Nebraska, when Wendy had her seizures, and when I heard from, the, from Brent that it was a brain bleed, I knew immediately what that meant because Mary Jean's mother had suffered a cerebral hemorrhage and therefore as we're heading up and going very rapidly I'm wondering if we are going to get there before she dies and wondering if I'm going to have to conduct the funeral and I'm crying out to the Lord at that moment Lord you have to take care of this I don't know what your plan is God help in this situation because my stressing over it wasn't going to help I did set the cruise control so I didn't speed. I made sure of that. Notice second. We can and should center on what God has already done. And not just what he has yet not done. God has a plan. I know this according to God's word. Things aren't going to get better on this earth. They're going to get worse before he comes back. How worse they get, I don't know. And the worse it gets, the more I'm going, how long can you wait, Lord? You got to come. You got to come. But I know this. He will come at exactly the moment he planned from eternity past, and it will be exactly right. I've got to trust God. He has a plan. Third, Realize that God considers all saved saints great. All saved saints. You don't have to say, well, Billy Graham was really amazing. Look at what he did. Look at Billy Sunday. Look at all those evangelists that were before. Look at the John MacArthur's of our time, the Charles Stanley's. Do you realize this? That God says because his son and his Holy Spirit is dwelling within all believers, all believers are great. Because they have a great God within them. And therefore, he wants to use you to do great things. You may not consider what you do great. But it may be super in God's plan. Be faithful. Do what he says. It will bring honor and glory to him. Now, we talked at the beginning about unbelief. 
I hope you don't fall into that category. I just won't believe that God is Savior. I just won't believe that he died upon the cross for my sins. I just won't believe that he rose again the third day. That's not for me. That's what the Pharisee said. You may have some doubts because God hasn't filled in all the details. But you have trust in him. Today I'm asking simply this. If your heart was looked at, do you have absolute trust that Jesus died on your cross for your sins, that he was buried and raised again the third day, and that you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior? Because according to the word of God, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you will be saved. And you have to do that. Without doing it, it doesn't happen. Do you know Christ? Have you trusted him? Have you made him your Lord, your Savior? Let's pray. Father, I come to you right now, and Lord, I want you to look at every heart that is here. Lord, you know the status of every heart. Do they trust you? Do they rely upon you? Have they accepted what Jesus Christ did for them upon the cross of Calvary? Do they realize that he is God, that he died for them, that he was buried and raised again the third day? Do they realize that if they call upon the name of the Lord, they will be saved? It's not because of what they've done, it's because of what he has done. And that brings salvation. Lord, help us when we doubt. Help us when we don't think we can do. Help us when we don't think that we are able to accomplish what you've planned for us. May we, God, be people who trust and rely upon you. And Lord, we'll ask that in the name of the one who loved us and gave himself for us. In the name of Jesus, amen. Pray. Father, I pray for each one that is here. You know the hearts. I pray, Father, that each one may come to a point where they recognize, one, that we are sinners. We failed you. We, Father, are worthy to be separated from you. May they recognize, second, that your son loved them so that he came to die on the cross for their sins. He bore in his body their faults. May they third recognize that simply by clinging to him, relying upon him, accepting him as their Lord, their Savior, as the only basis of their salvation, they can have salvation this day. And may they, God, commit their heart to you. Lord, it's not what we have done. It's what you have already accomplished that saves us. Send us forth with your blessing and your benediction upon us. And may we proclaim the fact that Jesus Christ saves souls. In Christ's name we pray, amen.